I hope you don't get a headache from my speech today and maybe it's much easier for you sometimes going to be very complicated. I ask you to make an update about infectious bronchitis and infectious bronchitis really is first reported since 1931. It's a very, very, very old disease and it is an acute, rapidly spread viral disease of chickens affecting a chicken of all ages and it is worldwide distributed. I believe at the beginning we know infectious bronchitis because the first isolation has come from chickens which have an respiratory symptom, symptoms and that's why we think it is respiratory disease is infectious bronchitis, that's the name. By the time we know that affect besides the respiratory system, also oviduct, kidney, as well as the gastrointestinal tract. Why we speak about infectious bronchitis? Because we speak about economic impact of infectious bronchitis. It's mostly causing a decrease in body weight and performance, and as you see here, birds of the same age, and here birds of the same age infected with bronchitis, you have some small birds in between. We have a very huge economic impact because, because drop in egg production and the reduction in eggshell quality, as you see here, there's a layer flock from Ecuador, brown layer, and you see a lot of white egg shell. Also, in case of the broiler, we have a secondary infection with other bacterial disease. Infectious bronchitis can cause a pericarditis with pericarditis and increase of contamination rate in the slaughterhouse. And in some cases, we have a high mortality. And uh, if we speak about economic impact of any disease, if you are going to vaccinate it, it does mean additional vaccination cost. We have to calculate the vaccination cost as an economic losses if we are not vaccinated. Also, sometime in case of viral disease like infectious bronchitis, if we have a secondary bacterial infection, we have to treat the birds against secondary bacterial infection. Does that mean increase of medication cost too? Coronavirus, I would not dying to bother you, but it is belong to the family Coronavirus. It is the coronavirus as a genus, and we have a three different groups. Two come in mammals, and the group number three causes infectious bronchitis virus, which is in chicken. We have an effeasant corrosion virus, and we have a coronavirus enteritis of turkey. It is a polymorphic enveloped with the spikes, and we're going to speak a lot about these spikes. And uh, the one important thing, if it is an enveloped virus, is that mean it can easily inactivate it with, within 15 minutes as 56 degrees centigrade or 90 minutes by 45 degrees centigrade. And, and the one important thing, it is sensitive to the most common disinfectant. Does that mean if you clean and disinfectant, probably then you can kill the infectious bronchitis virus. I go to speak with you a little bit about the spikes and the envelope of the virus because we have a different structure protein and it's one is a spikes glucoprotein that is this one here and it is very important for virus attachment epitopes as well as for neutralization epitope. It is very very important thing and we have a membrane and as well as envelope protein here and we have a nucleotide protein which it is a conservative region between all coronaviruses and this is one it is important when we're going to speak about the diagnosis later on because if we make a BCR based on the conserved region, we can detect it all coronaviruses or all CO type. The spikes protein it is very important and we have a two different units, spikes protein 1 and spikes protein 2. And the, uh, the spikes protein 1, it is very important because the high genetic variation within the S1 protein is uh, responsible for multiple CO type and variant strain. We speak a lot about variant strain later on, and that's the mutation in this area, make a new variant or make a some mutation. We have a difference in the virulence and tropism between the strain are existed. That means we have a different strain which can some affect the respiratory tract, some may be the digestive tract, and so on. However, the primary application of all infectious bronchitis virus occur in respiratory tract. The birds infected by inhalation of the virus and move in the body, go to the respiratory tract, and sometimes directed to the production tract, and we replicate a lot in the gut. But we have also some nephropathogenic strain 
which will implicate in kidney and may also in a productive tract. You can find the virus all over the body, not only in respiratory tract, but in most of all tissues in the body, you can find coronavirus after the infection. The virus persists in the intestinal tract and for a longer period and is excreted in the feces for a longer period too. We have a lot of different strain around the world and every laboratory gives a name of about strain. And if you see here, we have a lot of them which cause respiratory, all in white, and we have some in blue which are nephropathogenic strain. And recently we hear a lot about 491, we hear a lot about QX strain, and from the Venter Holland, we hear about D388. And we're going to speak about this strain later on. Anyhow, it is very, very, very complicated because we have some strain which are genetically identical by they have designated with quite different number, as I mentioned before. The question, why we have a different strain and with different serotype? Firstly, because the wide use of the vaccine make an immunological pressure on the virus. And reduction of the dominant serotype by vaccination, this means we have a vacuum and other field strain become active. It's what, what we call like by influenza, antigenic drift. It's some change in the amino acid of the S1 and can produce a new variant. But sometimes, if you get a two serotype infected the same cell, then we get a recombination due to a mixed infection and we have what we call antigenic shift and we have a quite different new serotype. Both of them, as most of RNA viruses, are really have the mutation rate, it is very, 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 very high. Several different serotypes can circulate in the same area and at the same time. However, we have some serotypes are restricted in some geographical areas, and we have some serotypes can found worldwide. And the story really has started with the infectious bronchitis. We have a mash of set 1930, and 1951, we get a connected cut, which is the first variant in the United States. And get in Holland in the 60s, the Dutch variant strain 274 or 1466 from belts which have showing a brown egg production in both layer and boiler beta flux. And we have a little cross protection is provided by heterologous vaccine that we're going to speak about that later on also. In 80s, we get in Belgium a nephropathogenic strain because the Horta and the Grey strain was firstly found in Australian and then Later on, many years after, we found that in Belgium. And that's the most famous one we get in the 90s in the United Kingdom is the 491. And 4 is in the number of the sample and this is the year of isolation. What you have really the same, you can find the same strain under 793B or even from France, CR88, or are related to each other. In year 2000, we get Italy U2 in Italy. And also we start to speak about QX virus, which really found in 1996-1997 in China. And currently, in 2010, nobody knows exactly how many variants we have, maybe more than 65 variants described worldwide. 491, it is, is a very important strain, really, which it is isolated from broiler breed of flux, showing muscular tremor, cyanosis, hyperventilation, disease, tracheitis, and bilateral vector muscle myopathy. It was related in 1990, or the described in 1992, but the strain obtained in 1991. And the QX strain, it is, as I told you, it is an important strain, which currently make a lot of problem around the world. It started in 1996-1997 in China, isolated from bed, showing proven tracheitis. They have also respiratory distress, nephritis, nephrosis, mortality, reproductive disorder, does that mean false layer, dropping egg production, and reduction in eggshell quality. That's about the history of the strain. This strain started in this area in China, then spread around China within one year without any problem. Then we see that in Russia in 2001. Does that mean from 1997, it's about three years, bus from China to Russia. And in the East Russia, to the West Russian take more than one year and detected in 2002 in the European part of Russian. 
and from 1997 till we get to the Europe, we get in 2004. It takes more than six years. We are not sure if the infection is coming from Russian or coming directly from China. But you see that this strain spread very slowly from one area to other area, and when to come to the Europe, we get a lot of problem within a short period of time. As is the first was in 2004 in France, and we get a problem in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany, and 2005 in Italy, and again we have in France moved to the south part, and we get in Spain, we get in United Kingdom in 2008, and now we have a lot with QX, even in the Middle East, it was for a couple of weeks in Egypt, and you have a lot of problem with the QX strain. If we look for the phylogenetic strain of these QX groups from different strains, which are located alone, which are a little bit far genetically from uh, 491 or 793B, as well as from the vaccinal strain H120 and Massachusetts uh, M441. Does that mean there is a genetic variation? The problem is that, does that mean we don't have a cross protection between this strain or not? We're going to speak about that later on. Infectious bronchitis virus have been isolated from several aquatic as well as non aquatic birds. And all of these birds become found coronavirus. The question is, is this coronavirus related to the avian coronavirus or not? And uh, we know that it is, it, it, you cannot, if you see for this work from 19, 2009 in England, they isolated a lot of viruses as I mentioned before, and the only from duck and Huber swan, they see is most of them are related to the H120, which is a vaccinal strain and others are very far from chicken uh, viruses. What about the transmission of the disease? We don't have any vertical transmission. We have only an horizontal transmission. Does that mean direct contact between infected and non-infected birds? And indirect, like into contaminated equipment and neighbor. How to make a diagnosis of infectious bronchitis? The diagnosis really, it is a very problematic infectious bronchitis and an all respiratory disease. What is the problem? You can see the problem here or the problem there. You can find what's the problem. The problem is that diagnosis is not black and white. As most of the veterinarian work in the field, they go to the flock or they go to inside the house, see some respiratory disease and said it is infectious bronchitis. Others said it is influenza. They said, said it is maybe in your castle. Anyhow, why it is the diagnosis not black and white in, in all respiratory disease? Because the clinical signs and the ghost lesion are not specific. As the first, if we try to summarize all the symptoms of the infectious bronchitis, we said if we have an early infection in the first week of age, we may get a false layer. In the rearing period, we got mostly respiratory as well as kidney damages. During the production, we have mostly respiratory symptoms which is started if the birds start to laying by week 18 and go on. The clinical signs, if we have an respiratory manifestation, we have conjunctivitis, nasal discharge, sneeze, sneezing, sneaking, coughing, tracheal rails, gasping. These are symptoms you can find in all respiratory diseases. I show some birds nasal discharge, some conjunctivitis, and here gasping, as you see here. And here again, in layer flock, we have a gasping. And if you see here, this is a bird which may be typical for infectious bronchitis, but could be also H9N2, could be also Newcastle disease. As you see, they have a some respiratory distress. Okay, you can see that here. The mortality is usually low unless complicated by other factor and or infection. Does that mean we said many factors which pave the way for infectious bronchitis? This could be a bacterial infection or even management. And uh, if you look for all of that, live vaccine can cause a problem, for example, in your castle, or if you use H52. Uh, if you have a mycoplasma infection, or micro, like mycoplasma galiceptical, mycoplasma synovia, ORT, Escherichia coli, low pathogenic avian influenza, especially H9N2, can make a lot of problems. What we see, firstly, if you have to do with the layer flock, we have a drop in eggshell quality for six to eight week, week or sometimes months. As you see, sen shell, you hear very sen shell, a lot of broken shells. And we can see also rough eggshell or misshaped eggshells. And this can you see also in case of 
influenza as well as in Newcastle disease. And sometimes we have the bill shell eggs, as, like, as you see here. It could be also uh, egg drop syndrome, which can cause a similar symptom. And if we infected the birds experimentally, we're doing them for past, before we speak about variant strain, you can see a severe drop in egg production if you infected the birds during the production. And this is here when we start to speak about the variant strain 49. This is a work from United Kingdom. They took for two flock A and B. The birds are vaccinated with Massachusetts State and UK 682 and they're infected by 491, and you can see we have a drop in egg production. We see when we get a QX infection in 2004, 2005 in Germany, there's a flock non infected. You can, feel, you can see the lay, laying uh, curve, it is very normal. If you see here with infected flock, you have a drop in egg production, which really extended for over 20 weeks. We have also a reduction, we reduced internal egg. Shell uh, egg quality, what, what we call watery white, as you see here, as you see here too, and as you see here. And it is it's a very complicated thing because the thinning of sick album does mean reduce the quality of the eggs. If you look for the gross lesion, if you have an respiratory manifestation, we can see we have an cases exudating the trachea. You can see also here in the upper part of the trachea. And you have an aerosaculitis, which mostly caused by secondary bacterial infection. We have also pericarditis, hepatitis, but mostly due to ORT or Escherichia coli. If you have an early infection, we have a neonatal infection, we have a damage of the oviduct, and we have a non-laying, hence what we call false layer. This is in a very old uh, symptoms what we see in the past, described in, in 60, but we get a lot of problem in 2003, 2004, started in the Netherlands as well as in, in, in China with a QX strain, and we get in Germany by November 2004. As you can see, the birds look like penguin, we stay like penguin, because you have a lot of load in the abdominal cavity. You can see also in the brown layer exactly the same if you look for that here. And if we started to open the birds, if you are not carefully, you have a lot of water in, or exudate in the face. But this is the abdominal of the birds infected with a QX stream, and if you open that carefully, you can see that it is not ascites. There is a fluid in the oviduct, and I can show you a lot of picture about that. Okay? You can see. I believe it is very, very, very clear for the people who like to make a photo. You can take more than 1.2 uh, liter from the fluid from the uh, from the oviduct, and the oviduct wall is very, 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 very thin, like here. However, in all cases, we see that the ovary is still active, really, and you see the number of yellow follicles. In the past, we see also in some cases, you can see an active ovary. The oviduct is very short and narrow, and we have an egg in the abdominal cavity. Also, from many, many, many years ago, you can see that the cyst formation of the rudimentary right oviduct you know, if you open the carcasses and you see the dormantal or right oviducts, the birds have only one oviduct, which is the left one. If the right one have an assist formation, you have to suspect it on infectious bronchitis, like you see here. And with nephropathogenic strain, you can see different picture of the kidney damage, and it is increased in the recent year and become common problem in the layer flock. And it is mostly accompanied with a high mortality as a result of kidney damages. And after apparent recovery, chronic nephritis can produce sudden death, especially in the brown layer. In general, if you have to do with nephropathogenic strain, we have a depression, roughly the feather, wet dropping. This is very important to see. We have an increased water intake if you control the water. And sometimes we have a mortality which can reach 80% in the broiler flock. This is all what I mentioned. It is really not specific enough for infectious bronchitis. And if you have to have to make a differential diagnosis with all respiratory diseases, and I showed you yesterday something like that, we have non-infectious causes and infectious causes, 
you have to think in Newcastle, influenza, TRT, and so on, and a lot of bacteria. And also, if you have a problem with the reproductive tract, you have also to think about several microorganisms, especially in that case, we have to think about egg drop syndrome, which is adenovirus, which can cause a drop in egg production, as I mentioned before. How to make an accurate diagnosis? It is not easy to make an accurate diagnosis, but if you would like to make really an accurate diagnosis, you have to make a laboratory investigation. And the laboratory investigation, does that mean you can detect the viral RNA, or you can detect the virus by electron microscopy, or by uh, immune fluorescence test. You can use even agar diffusion test if you have an good antibodies. You can make a BCR. You can isolate the virus, and you can detect the antibody. This is isolation of the virus. It is very easy if you have a chicken embryo, SBFX. Otherwise, you cannot get it. It is, we have an a shorter duration of the virus. Does that mean if you are not in early stage of the disease, you cannot isolate the virus very well? You need several passages, maybe three to four passages, in aim to get the effect of avian bronchitis virus. It is accompanied with high cost if you have to do in SPFX. You can isolate the virus also in, in tissue culture, like chicken embryo fibroblast, or chicken embryo liver cell, and you have mostly in cytobasic effect after a couple of passages. You can work it also with what we call tracheal culture organs. It is really a very easy one, and you can see if you're infected, you take a ring from one day old chicks or embryo, and infected them with infectious bronchitis, tracheal ring, and if they are not infected, you can see that the cilia are moving all the time. Can you see that here? And infected with the virus, we don't have any movement. And these methods are used also to evaluate the efficacy of the vaccine. And the tracheal ring culture, it is very easy. You can done in every laboratory. You take a very thin ring of the trachea and put it to media for the tissue culture, rotate it all, all the time, and then put it under a microscope and you can control them. You can see typing the isolate using HI test or neutralization test. However, the HI test or hemagglutination inhibition test is less serotype specific. Also, you need to prepare the antigen because infectious bronchitis have not hemagglutinin, but by indirect hemagglutination and hemagglutination inhibition test, you can detect the virus. However, the gold standard is neutralization test. You have to have anti serum against all serotypes. It takes a long time, but it is a very important test. The question is, is the BCR the solution and aim to differentiate the viruses and detect the virus? We could, with reverse transcriptase BCR using universal primer, may not bend to new, not bend to new variant type, leading to the false negative results. But in the most of the case, if you have a good primer, you can detect it most of the isolate. The problem with the BCR, we cannot differentiate between the field strain in most cases and vaccinal strain, and that is a little bit different than the gumbo, what, what we hear today from Jack David. And we've done a lot of some work in, in, in 2001 to know the duration of the shedding of the vaccinal strain. And in that case, we take a Nobles 491 and we take an SBF old chicks and we vaccinated by nasal, ocular, and oral, and we have a group non-vaccinated, and we control the birds for 63 days. And I show you the shedding in the trachea. You can see the shedding it is continuous, but at least if you vaccinated the birds orally due to recirculation of the vaccinal strain, you can detect it for more than 58 days. If you look for the nasal, you can only detect it for 14 days, for the ocular inoculation, you can find also just for 14 days. Does that mean, again, to summarize the result, you can detect it by tracheal swab, the vaccinal strain, for 14 days post-infection if you are vaccinated nasal or ocularly. If you're vaccinated orally, you can detect it until 58 days. If you take a colloquial swab, it is a very interesting thing. You can detect the strain in the colloquial swab if you're vaccinated orally by more than 63 days. That's the day of determination of the experiment. 
if you vaccinated ocularly, you can detect it this till 48 days. Again, the summary, nasal until 32 days, ocular until 48 days, and oral 63 days. Does that mean if just to look for 491 and the best are vaccinated by 491, you are not sure if it is a field infection or vaccinal strain. Then we tried to develop a molecular system for detection and typing of the field isolate circulating in Germany. What we're doing it is here is a li little bit complicated, but it's very easy. We make first a BCR, it's conservative region. We use the primer for Handbag, published in 1990, and we make a specific primer located within the S1 gene region for 491, also the same the other primer described by the same author, and we establish a primer for detection of QX strain. And here, with this universal primer, you can detect most of IB virus strain, H120, 52, and so on, and even some variant strain, and field 91. With a specific primer, you can detect only, for example, for 491, 491, for QX, you can detect only QX, and you cannot detect it any other strain. Does that mean if you look specifically for 491 or QX, you can run by that way. Then we would like to differentiate all of them, and we establish another primer and make what we called primer, which is amplified a part of S1 gene, and we make an restriction enzyme analysis or sequence analysis. I move by that way. If you move by that way, you can detect it with the S gene, you can detect it uh, massage set strain, Budet strain 491, D274 uh, and D88 from the venter. And uh, if you use a restriction enzyme analysis with two different enzymes, you can differentiate between all these strain without any problem. And if you have another problem, you have to send the BCR product to sequence and you can detect it or you differentiate very well. We tested in Germany in our lab from 2004 to 2009 a lot of sample for 491 and QX, and we can found at the beginning we have a lot of problem with 491. We are not at that time we are not vaccinated a lot with 491, and by the time go to be to decrease, and at the same time we have an increase with the QX strain from 2004 till 2008 and 2009. And if we look for QX strain, now mostly coming from the broiler flocks and a little bit in the layer flock. If you look for the 491, we have a lot layer and broiler as quite similar with the inf infection or the detection rate. Then we look for QX and we make an experimental infection in one day old SBF broiler. It is quite different than normal SBF. Normal SBF is a layer type and we would like to look for that in the broiler or meat type. And uh, really, we isolated the strain in our lab and we infected the birds by that way. One day, all the chicks are vaccinated uh, ocular nasal with uh, our strain, Flugel Berlin, from 2006. And we lift the group as a control. We take a colloquial swab, tracheal swab at different time and look for the tissue distribution. What we did see, as you see here, is a swab what we take, colloquial swab, second day booster infection, six day booster infection, 10 day and so on. And we take some organs from some birds which we killed and they're going to use the result. The firstly non-infected control didn't show any clinical signs, no mortality, no gross lesion. All the testing samples were negative. From the infected group, we see a depression, diarrhea, ruffled feather, best event, mostly from day two to day nine booster infection. We have an respiratory distress from day three to day seven, post infection, and the mortality is about 13% and occurred from day four to day nine. That is the symptom, as you see here, gasping. We have an best event by third day post infection. And by day four, we have exactly the same, and we have an increase of the best event. If you go later in, we have some gout, as a visceral gout, you have a damage of the kidney by day four burst infection. By day five, the several gout, uh, visceral gout of the kidney is totally damaged, as you see here, by day 10. This is a picture from day 10 
as as you see, and very very huge damage is the kidney, and we have a visceral gout as you see here. And we take a cloacal swab and a tracheal swab, and we can detect it, the viral RNA with a real time PCR, which established for that, and from day two till day 21 by all tested sample, and by day 28 by all tested sample cloacal swab. If you look for the tracheal swab, we have the same result. However, in day 21, we have only a few number of positive compared to the tested sample. Does that mean it is we have a highly shedding in the intestine? And the, if you look for the, the amount of the virus, does that mean here's the amount of the virus, is the number of cycle read for real time BCR, does that mean we have a high amount of the virus in the cloacal swab compared to that of the tracheal swab? If you look for the other organs, you can detect the virus also in several organs, in the thymus, in the lung, in the liver, and in kidney. However, in, by day 28, you cannot detect it any virus more in the thymus, but you can detect it some in the lung, and you don't have anything in the liver and kidney. But if you take a cecal sample and send that for the diagnostic, you can detect the virus all the time. The cecal tonsil are working as a filter of the virus, you can find the virus, and the most of the old viruses, cecal tonsil is a very good sample for detection of infectious bronchitis virus. I believe we can pass by that way. And if we look for the antibody after the infection, we use a normal ELISA, and you can find by day 21, we have and most of the sample, 25% uh, of the sample were positive. By day 28, 56% uh, 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 of the sample were positive. Does that mean the immune response with ELISA, which it is for IDEX ELISA at that time, you can detect it as some antibody response. It takes a longer time than if you used a vaccinated strain. And the serology, in general, for, isola for the uh, diagnosis of infectious bronchitis is of a less value because we use a lot of the vaccine and you cannot say is it an antibody, is it coming from vaccination or coming from the field infection. The disease con prevention and control, how to do that? It is, you can do by Arabic way maybe, you can do by African way, you can do by any way, what would you like, but it's mostly is the same, it is the biosecurity, sanitation, monitoring and early detection. And as you heard from Jack DeVitt, monitoring is not a picture, it must be a movie. You have to monitor all the time for this disease. And the one of the important step for the control of the disease is a vaccination. And as you heard, we have a live vaccine as well as inactivated vaccine. The live vaccine replicate in the respiratory tract, stimulate local, humoral, and cellular immunity at the same time, and inactivated for lawyer and reader. Inactivated vaccine need life priming. It's simulate only form resistant title. Because of the vaccine outbreak, is it management birds, vaccine, bull vaccination, subclinical infection with other immune? Suppression diseases, 
like IBD, chicken anemia virus, mycotoxin, infection with the field strain, short before the vaccination, infection with strain. The cause of the vaccine outbreak is, for example, it is not correctly applied, the vaccine, and not include all serotypes or variant. That means if we have a virus mutation, we may have a problem. In general, different serotype of IBV do not cause protected. That's what we know all the time. However, some strains show the cross protection against other serotypes and consider as protected protector types. What does that mean and why? A new serotype may emerge as a result of the few changes in the amino acid sequence of the S genes of the virus spikes and most of the genome remain unchanged. So only in few changes in the amino acid and uh, we can protect against other types. This may be a reason why IB vaccine of a specific serotype can protect against other serotypes. And that's what why we take protector type and not CO type. And there's a lot of trial done really by several authors and several companies concerning heterogeneous protection. Uh, they vaccinated, for example, the group from Entervet, MA5 at the first day, 491 at day 14, MA5 at day 1, and 491 at day 14 under control. They challenge the birds at 50 weeks of age and look for the protection by cellulostatic test five to seven days later on. And this is one example the use for challenge here in the Japanese strain, and you can sound the protection index with the given M5 alone, it is about 90, 80%, 491, 75. If you give the both vaccine, you have over 80% of protection. And similar is going with, you have a strain from Honduras, and again, if you have a both combination, you have about 80% protection compared to lesser protection if you use 491 alone or MR5 alone. And if you use a strain from South Africa, again, post-vaccination, day one, MR5, and later on, 491, you have a much better protection in comparison to using a single vaccine alone. and protection against Italian O2. This work done in Italy, they vaccinated the broiler flocks at day one with MA5 and at day 14 with 491. They challenged the birds by day 636 with Italian O2 and looked for the protection index and they found by day 40, that means four days after infection is 92%, uh, um, seven days after the infection by 90%, if you use the same by other group, which is challenged later on by day 56, you have a protection by 95% after 60 days, four days after the infection, and here six days after infection by 91%. The group C is just only vaccinated with both vaccine at the first day of age, and you have a good protection, which it is a little bit lesser than use the two different vaccine in between 14 days. Another protection against Italy O2 was carried out by Wartungen and Jones in 2005. They used an IB vaccine with the Massachusetts set plus Arkansas and used IB Brahma H120 and D274. And if you see, we have a good protection also and the cellulostatic protection this is really by here if you use uh, master set and our cancers by roughly 88 percent and here by roughly 89 percent this is mean and a very good protection did you hear about d388 it is really a, a deventer strain which is, is coming from uh, holland it is uh, closely related to qx strain and uh, the jane cook done uh, some experimental trial using this one here they vaccinated the birds with MR5 plus 491 and other group are vaccinated by 274 and Massachusetts strain 
And as you see here, the protection index is, is very low, but the group vaccinated with MR4 and 491 it is about 40, 50 percent after five days, after nine days post-infection in both groups are very, very, very low and not more than 38, 37 percent. Another histological protection is it carried out by uh, Ford Dutch and currently is so Otis or Pfizer. They produce a live vaccine, attenuated live vaccine from Coex strain, which is related in Holland, I believe it is the number of the strain, and applicated by day one in broiler and day seven by layer flux. It gives a full protection against smokeless strain of QX. We don't have any more data about that. We have a cross protection against 793 or 491 and the Italy 02 challenge when accompanied with IBH120 and the D274. Does that mean these are also from that company, these and QX strain, which is vaccine strain directly against QX strain. And uh, these are some also work from Israel, which uh, by the, the company Abbott Biological Laboratory and FIBRO, and they develop an attenuated life infectious bronchitis vaccine from Israeli isolates. And they have a different variant, and if you look for the variant strain, you have a variant here, you have a variant here, 120, you have a variant here, and another variant here, a lot of variant strain. And uh, what they did, they isolated the virus in 1996, and they called variant 1. You have a homology more than 96% with 491. The virus was attenuated in embryonated chicken eggs. And they, they vaccinated the birds and they challenged them. They vaccinated the first group with H120 with the variant strain and plus variant strain. And here H120 plus 491. And then vaccinated with the variant strain two wise and here non-vaccinated. And if you look for the cellulostatic activity, you have a protection if you vaccinated two wise with the variant strain, or if less protection if you vaccinated with H120 and 793 or 491. And here again is less if you use 120 plus variant strain. It is much better if you use two variant strain at the same time. Future of approach for the control of infectious bronchitis is it mean you need flexibility. What does it mean of flexibility? The, the very important thing in the flexibility is, or why is the flexibility, is that you have to firstly, what's the governmental regulation before to start the new not licensed vaccine? You have to know the epidemiological situation in one area. You have to know the goal of vaccination, the availability of the vaccine, and the cost benefit analysis. If you don't have this information, you cannot use any vaccine which coming from one area. At least in Europe, you need to have a vaccine which is licensed in one country or in one area. And all I mentioned before concerning infectious bronchitis and the factor which may reduce the efficacy of the vaccine under the field condition are very, 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 very old. It is a paper published in 1987 and really it described that the complex is this individual, the genotype or phenotype, immune competence and state of the health, that means nutritional condition, immune suppression condition, which influences the efficacy of the vaccine. Vaccination management is the mean the program, what we use, the choice of the vaccine, and the disease situation, and immunity of individual animal, flock immunity, virulence field strain, multifactorial disease like respiratory disease, season on the climatic, season started vaccination, what about the humidity and temperature can play a very important role. And again, also the type of husbandry or housing and housing management can play an important role in aim to determine the efficacy of the vaccine. The future abuse concerning the vaccine, we, there's a lot of work concerning using a vector vaccine or a reverse genetic vaccine or multiple epitope DNA vaccine. We don't know, it takes a long time to get some of them licensed. And uh, we have to look in the future about new variants. Does that mean we have to make a continuous surveillance? It is very essential to know what is going on, especially if you have a vaccine outbreak. If you're in vaccinated flock, you still have a problem with infectious bronchitis. And some people started to use what we called homologous vaccine. 
This is working very well. If you have a strain isolated and make inactivated vaccine, and uh, you can use it in your farm. But till you isolate this strain, it takes a long time, and the infection may be widespread till you have a really an homologous vaccine. As we see vaccination combination with two different strains like MR5 or like uh, also 491 as an example or a cancers with, with H120, it may be ineffective in most of the cases. And uh, when new molecular vaccine, what we would like to get in the future should be carefully evaluated with regard to the efficacy, cost and the acceptance. And this is a very, very, very important thing. I hope you don't get a headache or tired from me, and if you get it, take it easy, and thank you very much for your attention.